Hi, I'm Jeff Davis of the Sonoma County Wine Library. My guest today is one of the female pioneers in the wine industry. And uh, it's a shame that so many people who are worthy enough of having their histories recorded for future generations often are not household names. But Zelma Long has worked with Robert Mondavi, Simi, and Domaine Chandon, and has numerous accolades and honors throughout her long career. Zelma Long, thank you for joining me today. A pleasure. We're here in your backyard above Chalk Hill Road. Might hear a truck go by or two, but <laughs> that's part of the, the industry, isn't it? Yes. You have crafted and consumed fine wine throughout your career, but you also have a great thirst for education, don't you? I do. I love to learn. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been good at what I've done, because I've learned a lot while I was working, mm -hmm. especially about viticulture, but also about winemaking. Before we go further, uh, where did you, uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Eastern Oregon in a town called the Dalles on the Columbia River. And I grew up there, graduated okay. from high school. Then I went to Oregon State University in Corvallis. Yes, I saw that. I was, I was going to ask you about that. And that's why you went to OSU, because you lived up in that area. Exactly. Um, and after that, though, you did come down to the Bay Area. You had a chance to do an internship at University of California, San Francisco Hospital. Is that correct? You know what I did? I came down between my sophomore and junior year hmm. to work at UC Berkeley in their Department of Nutrition. I was just an intern. And I met uh, Bob Long, who I was to marry after I graduated from college. Oh. And then um, after I graduated from college, I had a science degree. And my mother had suggested maybe nutrition would be a good thing for a young woman to do. So I had majored in nutrition, minored in science or vice versa. And I started working at UC um, San Francisco Medical Center. Okay. And at first I did an internship for a year. Then I looked around for a job. Uh -huh. And so you had a short career as a dietitian, from what I understand. So well, I worked two years in the Oakland um, Alameda Hospital, and we lived in Oakland near Lake Merritt. Hmm. But then we took a year off and went to Europe. And nice. that, that was a transition, let's say, because when I came back, at that time, nutrition wasn't that important to doctors or people, it wasn't like it is now, where mm. now everything you put in your mouth is important. It wasn't that way at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father-in-law was starting a vineyard up in Napa Valley in the Eastern Hills. And so I thought, well, I have a science background. I'll go back to school and study winemaking. That, that totally changed it. your career. At yes, least it started it on a different, different path. It certainly did, yeah. thankfully. <laughs> yes. And that was about, what, 1966? I graduated from college in 65, so it was 68 and 69. I was going to Berkeley working on my, I mean, going to Davis working on my master's okay, so in enology and viticulture. And then in the summer of 70, Mike Gergich called me. Uh -huh. Or he actually, he called the house and he called my mother and she could hardly understand its name, but she gave me his phone number. So I called him back and he said, you know, I'm looking for someone to work harvest with me at Robert Mondavi. And I said, well, I can't. My mother is visiting. I'm going back to school, but thanks for calling. The next day he called back wow. and he said, this will be a great learning experience for you. You know, you work through harvest, you'll see the wines, and you really should consider it. So I said, sure, just for the fall quarter. Sure, that's what they all say. <laughs> so you went to, you decided to go pursue an analogy and viticulture degree. You go to UC Davis, you're gonna get a master's. Right. You're there for, you said, what, two years? Two years. And. How did Mike Gergich get your name? Like, what inspired him you know, to call he you? He called the professors at UC Davis and they gave him my name. Wow. 
So you were already making a blazing a trail by that point. I guess. <laughs> so you worked at Mondavi for a number of years, didn't you? Yes. I, oh, quite a, quite a number. I started Harvest of 1970, and I left Harvest of 1979. So the first <laughs> year or two, I worked as Mike's assistant, and then the, the winery was growing. It almost doubled its uh, crush capacity for the first few years. And I figured he needed an assistant. So I wrote a job description for the assistant, and then I applied for the job, nice. got the job. <laughs> and then Mike left. He went to go to Chateau Montalena, and he made that famous Chardonnay yeah. that won the French competition. Mm -hmm. And so I was promoted to chief enologist at that time. That, I think that was 73. So you're one of those who understands the benefits of pursuing an opportunity, making it happen, and you certainly did in that case. That's correct. And what's this I read that uh, when you left Robert Mondavi to go to Simi Winery, he said that was one of his biggest losses he ever experienced? Oh, I didn't know he said that. That's really sweet. Oh, you didn't? No. Oh, mm -hmm. it's on your Wikipedia page. <laughs> <laughs> well, so sometimes things get out there, like uh, many places I've seen, it listed that I got my master's in enology at UC Davis, which uh, I did not. You, you never did completely. You know, so you never know where all this information comes from. But it was it was really fun to work with Bob Mondavi. He was very single-minded. We're going to make wine that's as best of the wines of the world. And, uh, and he was funny. He would come around with us during harvest, Mike and I would go around and taste all the fermenters. And one year he was like, well, you really shouldn't ferment those white wines um, over 55 degrees. And, and the next year it was, well, you really should ferment them at 60. So we're like, sure. But Mike was the guy. I mean, Mike, was a really great winemaker, as mm. has been proven yes. later. Yeah, so and helped you on your path for sure to become a yeah. better winemaker. And, and what a great experience to have the time there, Robert Mondavi, after he left. Yeah, it was, it was wonderful. And of course, the other thing that was wonderful is Paul Mondavi was very experimental. So mm. he, um, he bought grapes from the Central Coast. He bought some grapes from Washington. He bought various pieces of equipment, so there were a lot of opportunities to work with things just outside of the normal, what you would expect from your local vineyards. And it seems like you took that with you when you went to Simi Winery in 1979, because you really revamped that property, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And I was, uh, when I was hired, they had already made the decision. It was owned at that time by Shefflin and Somerset in New York, who was a marketing company for Moet Hennessy. Mm -hmm. And they had made the decision to revamp CME and invest in it. So there was a, an opportunity to build a, a fermenting cellar, which just doesn't come along every day yeah. for a winemaker. Yeah. Yeah. And there was also opportunity for me to acquire the grapes for the winemaking, which I was very interested in the vineyards. Hmm. So again, we're in the late 70s, early 80s. I should take a sidetrack here and ask you, did you have any uh, challenge being a woman in the industry at that time? Because you were certainly one of the few. Um, or were you well, so well respected I, that it wasn't even an issue? It wasn't much of an issue. I'd say what what was a little frustrating to me in Mandavi was that there was that glass ceiling of the family. Mm. You know, so Tim came in about halfway through my time there, and he was uh, slowly taking over the winemaking. And he was also, he's a great guy. It was lovely to work with him, but it also set a ceiling. So when the Simi people came through and said, you know, if you want to build a cellar, you would have this and so on. It was a, it was a good decision. Sure, yeah. And a nice opportunity to work in an, another county. Absolutely. And also interesting that you went, you left one of the newest wineries 
in Napa <laughs> Valley to one of the oldest wineries in Sonoma I County. I know, isn't that amazing? It was... Simi was established in 1876, I Yeah, think. It's something like that. I've forgotten that it was a long time ago. <laughs> and when you got there, it probably looked like it had been around for quite a while. It had, that old stone building had wooden floors, which I imagine it still has. And it had big uh, redwood fermenting tanks. And it was definitely old style. And I saw you were the VP of winemaking at CME. Did, were you hired at that title or did you obtain that after you'd been there for a little while? Uh, when I was interviewed, I told them I wanted to be the VP of winemaking. Well, you've had some great success <laughs> telling people what you want to have for yourself. Tell us about some of the revamping you did there at, at Simi Winery. Well, I built a new fermenting cellar. As I recall, it was 16,000 square feet. And we had a contractor, um, Michael Dixon, who was president, did not hire an architect. He hired a contractor who laid out, you know, it was basically a rectangular building, but I had to uh, furnish it, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the refrigeration systems, the systems to remove the pomace, the press, the fermenters, I, and the lab and the storage. I mean, I had to design everything and purchase the equipment. Nice. And I had a, a woman, Barbara Lindblom, who had worked with me at Mendaki, and she had done uh, lab work there. And so I basically hired her. We had a certain square footage for the lab. I hired her to lay out the lab. And then she became the first uh, lab director. I should point out that Marianne Graff was there at CME, wasn't she, before you? Yes, it, it had been a series of women winemakers because Isabel Simi Haig ran that winery for decades. Yeah. And then Marianne started, I think, around 1970. And she made that great 74 vintage and and she left uh, that year that I started. Um, she left in 79 and started Vinquery. And during your time at CIMI, once again, you decided to further your education. You went and got an executive uh, oh, degree? Well, that was 88. And I was slated to take over from Michael Dixon in 89. And so, I suggested that I go to Stanford Executive School. And because at that time, um, CIMI was owned by LVMH, Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, yeah, who, had, who had acquired CIMI um, in 81. And at that, even at that time, it was Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy. And so they acquired CIMI. And, um, there's some funny stories about that, which I don't think I'll relate. Oh, come on, please share. Well, you remember, you know, Bernard Arnault, who's a very powerful man. He has basically made LVMH into what it is. Mm. It's the world's largest luxury company. Mm -hmm. And he came to visit see me, and we sat down at lunch and he sat across the table from me and he asked me, what the difference was between Cabernet and Chardonnay. Really? And wow. so I very professionally, respectfully described the difference. But it told me that he wasn't sensitive to grapes and vines. Yeah. I mean, he was an amazing businessman. Well, and that ownership at Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, kind of led you into your next position, which was at uh, Domaine Chandon. That was a position right at the end of my time at CIMI. And what that ownership did during the 80s was it actually allowed me to do a lot of things overseas. Uh -huh. I, I, yeah. I worked, um, I went to Italy and worked in Chianti uh, for uh, Shefflin and Somerset. I went to several technical seminars with the LVMH group from all, because they had, they had a winery in Argentina that was making sparkling wine and they wanted to start making still wine. 
So I went down there to consult with them on Chardonnay. Nice. And um, we had a, a technical meeting in Epernay. <laughs> and then one time for marketing, I went on a trip uh, through Japan from north to south with the sparkling winemakers from Argentina and from Australia, Dimension in Australia. And I was supposed to be the as a spokesperson for Domaine Chandon here, which of course I did. But you know, in between the stops, I would be interviewing the other winemakers about how they did their sparkling wine because I never made sparkling wine. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, but Sini was one of the few still wine wineries that Alvin Mage owned. Hmm. So your new title was VP of Business Development. Right. So you, right. you just kept climbing, didn't you? Well, that was, that was um, at the same time I was doing that, I, my husband and I, Phil Freeze, started uh, a wine project in South Africa. That was around 1997. Mm -hmm. I left Simi, I essentially retired at the end of 20 years there, which is the earliest retirement I could do. And we had started the project in South Africa by buying uh, land in 97. And everybody thought we were totally nuts, you know, to be buying land in South Africa and making wine there. That was only uh, four years after the changeover, after the end of apartheid. Apartheid, yeah. yeah. Wow. I guess the wine industry was in its infancy at that point there. You know, strangely enough, it wasn't. The uh, South African wine industry is very, very old. Oh. And there are wineries there that were established in the 1800s. Okay. But it was not technologically advanced because the South African wine people weren't welcome in the rest of the world. So you were able to bring your talents and your skills at modern technology and that experience down to South Africa. Yes, in fact, Phil and I, because Phil was an experienced and highly respected wine grower. Right, I heard that. So yeah, from his perspective, you, a grape grower, you grow grapes and your end product are the grapes as they go out of the vineyard. From a wine growing perspective, the end product is the wine. And so all the work we, you do in the vineyard is focused on creating the kind of wine you want that's appropriate for that site. Mm -hmm. So we were invited down to South Africa in 1990 by the Cape Estate wine producers. Oh. And we, uh, together we gave an all day presentation to the industry about winemaking and wine growing. They were particularly interested in the use of barrels in winemaking. Hmm. And after that, they sent us to three different parts of the wine country, which is in the Cape, um, west of Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And each and at each place we stayed overnight with a vintner, and then there was a tasting the next morning where people from different vineyards would bring their wines, and mm -hmm. we would taste them with them and give our comments or discuss whatever they wanted. What a great discuss. introduction and opportunity for you it to get was. to know the, the area. It was fascinating and, and it allowed us to see a lot of parts of the wine country to experience the physical environment, which was maritime, mm -hmm. and to see the soils, which were very different from anything we have here, like uh, decomposed granite, and ancient soils in our vineyards, clay with rocks that goes back to a thousand or um, mm. not a thousand, a million or one and a half million years. Yeah. It's really old soils. So it was really interesting to yeah. us, you know, technically. And we thought, we could, you can make great wines here in South Africa. It has all of the components to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's really. I went back several times. I was invited back to taste for South African Airways oh. uh, and judge their wine, mm. the wines for them. And so I 
by the time we purchased our land, we both had a pretty good grasp on what the industry was doing, what their strong points were, what the weak points were. We actually wanted to contribute to the industry. Yeah, great. And so... And what did you choose to plant initially? We planted... They, we tasted a lot of good Cabernets and felt they could be better. Mm -hmm. And we were both very experienced with Cabernet and Bordeaux varietals. Mm -hmm. So we plant... And there's other reasons for planting Bordeaux varietals in the sense there widely planted, widely respected. Cabernet is probably the king of red grapes. At least it was at that time. So it was also a good commercial decision. Sure. So we planted Cabernet, Merlot, Malbec, and, um, gosh, what was the word? Malbec, not Petit, Cabernet Franc. Oh. Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Merlot. Okay, yeah. And it did well and still doing well? Oh, yes. Yeah, we're one of the top wines in South Africa. And uh, in 2016, our Bordeaux Blend Series C, we make two Bordeaux Blends, won the Seven Nations Wine Challenge um, Bordeaux Trophy. So nice. I knew, I knew you could make internationally great wine there. Tell us the name of the winery down there in South Africa. Villa Fonte. Villa it's, Fonte. And it's the name of the soil series in our vineyard. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we, we have tried to research where that name comes from, but we've been unsuccessful. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And you've had other opportunities. And about that same time, you started your consultancy. Some I started along. consultancy uh, pretty much after I left see me but it 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 kind of happened i wasn't yeah you were already going around the world and offering <laughs> yeah, advice and helping others i wasn't um, focused on doing consulting but i was approached by a couple yeah. of people to do it you got the work in, in bordeaux you had mentioned that a minute ago and also uh germany and yes france other well, places in france i guess and yeah Argentina, as you mentioned, Italy, and, and then you also right. started working with uh, the Washington uh, wine growing. Right. Uh, it was really folks. wonderful because I grew up in Oregon. I, yeah. I worked with both Oregon and Washington wineries. And I spent quite a long time, about 14 years, working at Golan Heights in Israel. I hear they have uh, great opportunities to make good wine there. They as well. do. Golan Heights uh, is. Um, it's at the base of mountains, so in the winter there's often snow, both in the mountains and on the ground, and so there's a good source of water, which is really important. And sure. I, I developed such a deep respect for the Israeli, uh, the winery was a big winery, crushing, I don't remember exactly, but maybe 5,000 tons. Mm. And so they made a wide variety of wines. I've seen a lot of big wineries around the world, but I've never seen one that operated at such a high level of skill mm. as that winery. It was really fun to work there. And quite a bit of what I was doing was uh, suggestions about the vineyards, because I could see right away that there were better ways to work with the vineyards. And so I would make some suggestions about what to do. And um, then I'd come back the next year and they would have done my suggestions. And then with the strategy, they'd taken it on a couple levels up. Oh. You know, they didn't just take information, they took it and ran with it. So it was very satisfying work. Yeah, you and it inspired gave me a, it gave me an appreciation of how small Israel is oh, and how smart those people are. Hmm. Interesting. It was very interesting. I'm so glad I was able to do that work. Is that one of your favorite places of all the locations you've had a chance to work in? Well, I worked there a long time. Some of these um, 
times when I went to Italy and Argentina were fairly, maybe a couple of years, or one time of uh, the German uh, winemaking we did was on our own behalf. And that was fascinating just because of the weather, understanding the weather in Germany. But the thing about Israel, it's so ancient. Mm. You know, you, you, I, I took a tour one time. They take you to sites where there were these copper smelting in, in these very old systems of rocks and fire and that copper used to be acquired from from Egypt and from the north of Israel. I mean, it was a central place for smelting copper in that whole region. And then you understand that Jerusalem is like 3,700 years old. Yeah. And you compare it with our, our, our country, yeah. our towns, it's phenomenal. I was going to say, if you have a process that works for thousands and thousands of years, why change it? Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there was a lot of change in that period. Right. At, at least with the, the smelting of copper. Maybe. Yes. Okay. No need to change that. <laughs> and there were places in the hills uh, where you'd see these big rock formations, and they're, they'd hollowed out a round circle where they would press the grapes, and then there was a dip in that circle hmm. where the juice would drain out into another area that had been cut out of the stone to hold the juice. I mean, Wow, it's yeah. yeah, gravity flow that seriously goes back old. quite a while. So yeah. quite a while. Huh. <clears throat> how fascinating, how, how yes. fun for you to see yeah. all of that and, and yep. participate in it. Exactly. Yeah. You've also uh, contributed to uh, numerous publications, including Mike Gergich's book. Oh, uh, yes. You did the, uh, the foreword for The Glass Full of Miracles. I know, I love doing that too, because I read the book first and mm. Mm -hmm. I was so, I mean, I knew Mike came from Croatia. I kind of knew his background, but when you read the depth of what he did, what he went through to get to Napa Valley, mm -hmm. all the places he worked, how he had to smuggle money out of Croatia, and then, of course, what he did in Napa Valley, he's really a phenomenal man. Yeah, yeah. I was... Uh, so when I wrote the introduction, I said, well, you'd think I'd be writing it about Mike in Napa Valley, but really, he had a whole life before he came to Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. And then was able to bring his nephew over, too, whose yeah. uh, Evo is yeah. very ingrained in, 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 at Gurgich Hills and has been for quite a while now. Which is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you also have two oral histories at the Bancroft Library in Berkeley, and uh, of course you've received numerous awards and accolades and honors over the years, for, just for a few, such as uh, Italy's Massey International yeah. Award, uh, you received the California State Fair Lifetime Achievement Award, the James Beard Hall of Fame, and you've been accepted to the Culinary Institute's uh, Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, certainly well deserved. You're probably mentioned in a number of other international <laughs> organizations. Well, I, you know, I was the thing. I was fortunate, and you know, starting a Robert Madoff, he gave me uh, a presence in the industry because sure. he was already a leader. I grabbed the opportunities that were afforded me. I loved working with other winemakers and learning about equipment and grapes and wine growing and trellising. I started um, with Diane Kenworthy, who became the president of the American Society of Enology and Viticulture. She worked as my uh, viticulturalist. And we started a group, um, it was the North Coast Viticultural Research Group, where a bunch of uh, viticulturalists and winemakers from Napa and Sonoma got together. And we funded research at UC Davis that connected winemaking and wine growing, connected viticulture and enology, which at Davis, they've been taught as separate disciplines, but the interaction of them haven't, hadn't been um, explored so much. 
And so we, and we each contributed, I think it was $4,000 a year. To, and there was eight uh, individuals, eight wineries. So that was a group, a, a section of money that we could give to UC Davis and say, here are some of the things we would like researched. Mm. And irrigation was one of them, rootstock, road direction, trellising issues. And then we would each um, experiment with those, like uh, put in four rows, two of one trellis and two of the other, or uh, Phelps did three different irrigation systems. And then we'd share the outcome and we'd um, share it with the university people that came to work with us. And then the university shares it with the wine regions around uh, yeah. Northern California. Plus, um, uh, Phil, for example, was the wine grower and wine purchaser uh, for Robert Madoffy, purchasing uh, six, seven, eight thousand tons between his, the vineyards and the purchase. And then Bob Steinhauer purchased for Behringer. So, the, and these guys didn't just buy the grapes, they went out in the vineyard and they talked about how to grow them. So a lot of the stuff we were learning got infiltrated out into the industry by those of us that have learned them. Yeah. And interesting, even decades later, they're still doing research projects and still learning more and more about Absolutely. wine growing and wine making. I know, I know. It's fascinating. I think it's the way um, Science goes, businesses go, you learn something, and then once you're there, you find something else, maybe three specific issues that you study mm -hmm. and improve, and then each of those three specific issues has two issues. <laughs> right, that, yeah. That, uh, and here we are in 2021, yeah. still, still learning. Absolutely. Yeah. I just looked at a, a wine enthusiast article that said, it talked about the California or the Napa wine industry from 78 to 88. It described it as the golden era of winemaking. This was in 1988. And it said in that period of time, 50 wineries emerged in the Napa Valley. Wow. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, there's 500 now. But I mean, that, that's what I was privileged to see mm -hmm. was that growth. And then I was able to apply that to other areas like uh, Argentina, to go into areas in South Africa and understand what that development curve could be. And we've seen a great development curve in South Africa. Oh, I imagine, yeah. The funny thing is, you've had this long, illustrious career, and then what do you do at this point? You went back to school again. <laughs> <laughs> you got a PhD last year. Yes, I did. And well, unrelated to the wine industry. Well, I, I've always loved and been interested in art, not as an artist, but as an art appreciation person. And whenever I really love something, I, I get serious about it. And I thought, well, I, you know, if I go back to school and study art, that would be so fantastic. Mm -hmm. And of course, the fact that I had never studied art before, <laughs> I had no masters or bachelors in art, uh, didn't deter me. It was a little more challenging though than you expected? Um, you know, what was actually challenging was not the course of study. It was, I was, the other thing is because most of my work has been scientifically based, I was interested in rounding out my knowledge in the mm -hmm. humanities. And there I was in the humanities and I actually, my professor that I had met was a professor in performance and one of the one of the parts of performance studies embodied knowledge like knowledge you have because if you picked it up you've learned it it you didn't go to school it's in it it resides in your body it's just like automatic 
mm -hmm. when something comes up. Mm. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And I'd really like to study how artists do their work, how they perform their work. And so that's what led me into performance. And then I was interested in Native American studies because when I was a kid, you know, my birthstone's turquoise. I was able to go to the Southwest a time or two. And, mm -hmm. and I'm also interested in other cultures. You know, we travel all over the world to see other cultures, but in fact, we have hundreds of Native American cultures here in the United States. Oh, yeah, for sure. And so that was a revelation and a wonderful of uh, course of study, which was my minor. Wow, good for you. I'm impressed with your ability of not being able to just sit around. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep moving. And it's yes. probably uh, c contributing to your, your youth. Yeah. You, you still have a very yeah. youthful exuberance about you. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> wow. And you know, and still, I just feel, you know, to some extent, all this stuff is rolled out. It just sort of naturally fl flowed, and I saw opportunities and followed them. But some people have a hard time having, for what for a variety of reasons, having that happen. And uh, so I feel. Well, I think I've a lot of that comes down to the ability to recognize opportunities, right. and you guide That's yourself, and that just correct. carries you along. That's absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So before we wrap up here, tell me about the wines that you are now bottling at the La Fonte and, and if our viewers would care to order some, how they can do so. Well, you know, I mentioned that we planted these four Bordeaux varietals and um, we have a partner in South Africa, a, young, a younger guy who grew up in a high-end winemaking family there. So it's this great partnership. I'm the winemaking partner, Phil is the wine growing partner, and Mike is the managing partner because oh, nice. he's on site. But he's, but he's a sales and marketing mm. genius as mm. far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. So it's a very strong partnership. Even though we're small, we only make about 5,000 cases of wine. But we talked among us, we obviously were going to make a Bordeaux blend and we started with the, the um, concept in Bordeaux, first wine, second wine. And I started making wine. We planted in one hectare blocks. I started making wine from each block in 2000 because nice. I wanted to see the character and personality of each of the blocks. Mm -hmm. And after I did that for two years, three years actually, I thought, you know, each of these blocks has the potential to be a first wine, and I don't want to have the mindset of a second wine. And furthermore, mm. they're different. Like there's Merlot that's really structured, and Merlot that's fleshy. There's Cabernet that's structured, and Cabernet that's fleshy. So somehow to put them all together seems like we would lose um, the potential personality of these sure, different yeah. blocks. So I suggested we do two wines, one that was Cabernet based and one that was Merlot based with a little bit of the Malbec. And that then, there, of course, there's a discussion about what do you call them? And so we did it simply, we did Series C in Series M. I have a BMW, so I like the series name. <laughs> and uh, Series C stands for Cabernet Style. It wasn't a percentage guarantee, it was style. Mm. And Series M stands for Merlot Style. Mm -hmm. But the Malbec was so successful in our blends, very fleshy um, and black fruit with the red fruit of the Merlot, that it the Series M came to stand for Merlot and Malbec oh, with a little bit of Cabernet for structure. And we don't have an outline of what percent goes in each wine Various each year. Vintage we vintage. start out with all the wines in front of us and taste them all and then assign them to the different blocks. Yeah, might as well. And 
then of course, like most wineries, we had some wine like pressed wine, wine from younger vines that should go into your lead wines. And so in 2012, we, I said to our marketing partner, you know, we need to take these wines and put them together and create a nice wine at a lower price point. Mm. So he named that wine Seriously Old Dirt. <laughs> and he named it because when Phil first saw the vineyard, he said, wow, this is seriously old dirt. Nice. Because it has, that vineyard has um, artifacts from Homo ergaster, who was pre-Homo sapien. Oh, jeez. Stone artifacts that you could see and wow. pick up. Oh. Um, so that's, that's what happened. Wow. And the two... The Series C and Series M were so useful because if you call a wine Joe and Sally, you know, the retailer may not remember sure. yeah. the, the, the difference. Mm -hmm. And so by saying Series C and M and they can connect it with a Cabernet and Merlot, it just made it easy. And we're selling those wines through Cape Ardor. Oh, That's the, the, the website. Wine website Cape, yeah Cape, and Cape it's Ardor. a r d o r and they have um a lot of very good south african wines and wines from new zealand and other places mm -hmm. so it's a good place and they can get your wine there they can get our wine there yeah. absolutely now interestingly when i asked you a few weeks ago we were talking about pinotage mm -hmm. and i asked you uh i was telling you i have i was having trouble finding some around here in northern california and you suggested cape Ardor. And so I did order a couple of Pinotages from there, but you didn't tell me about, uh, I should order some Villafonte. You should order some Villafonte. Oh, okay. <laughs> series M, Series C, and I will seriously old dirt. Well, Zelma, you are not only a pioneer, but you are also an inspiration to all winemakers, male and female, no doubt. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to get to know you, and I'm happy to share your story today. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to tell the stories. <laughs>